First of all, I'd like to thank Professor Bajaj for the kind words. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today I'm going to speak on the physiology of normal sleep from young to old. Whatever I'm going to speak uh, would be simple, very fundamental, probably known to many, uh, many of you would know more than what I am presenting. It is really difficult to find anyone who doesn't know about sleep. Also, it is extremely difficult to find anyone who knows everything about sleep. Um, so, with this uh, few words, uh, I start with uh, what is uh, behaviorally seen as sleep. When you look at the behavioral criteria, you find there is reduced motor activity, reduced activity per se, decreased response to stimulation, uh, and stereotype posture. To add to all this is the easy reversibility. And this uh, is particularly mentioned because it uh, is unlike coma, a hibernation torpor and estivation which are found in animals. Now coming to the scientific classification, scientific uh, um, so-called definition of sleep, uh, it is defined on the basis of a few, uh, primarily three uh, electrophysiological signals, namely EEG, EMG, and EOG, uh, representing the electrical activity of the brain, electrical activity of the muscles and uh, activity of ocular uh, muscles. In fact, if you look at uh, the definition and classification of sleep, one person's name stands apart. I mean, it has to be remembered, uh, Nathaniel Clitman, and who in as early as 1939 uh, wrote in a book uh, about the kind of sleep and sleep classification. And later, Rashefan and Kales uh, gave the classification which is followed broadly even today. And uh, very uh, recently, if you can consider 2007 as very recent, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine gave uh, some modification, essentially not much different from original classification as uh, Rashef and Caves. Now, coming to the uh, um, symbol or uh, signals which are used for uh, um, classifying and looking at sleep, our EEG, which is placed, can take from almost every part of the brain, but uh, um, you can have uh, parietal or occipital leads. And electrooculogram, uh, which gives the sense of eyeball movements, and electromyogram picked up from the chin muscles. Now, I'm really not going into the de uh, depth of classification because it will take a long, long time. And actually, it is better done uh, practically um, while the record is taken. Just to give you an idea that the wake um, signals primarily have the desynchronized EEG and eyeball movements and uh, EMG activity. And as you slowly go down to different stages, stage one, two, three, four, and uh, REM sleep, there is a difference uh, primarily in terms of 
voltage and frequency of the EEG uh, changes in the EMG and the ocular moment, which suddenly changes during REM sleep, about which I'll spend a few, few seconds. Before going that, I would like to say that the changes in uh, sleep wakefulness happens uh, in a cyclic manner. In this very diagrammatically shown picture, you can see that person who goes from wakefulness uh, slides down to stage one, two, three, and uh, stage four of sleep and spends uh, a few minutes, uh, which is varying from 15 to 30 or even 40 minutes, and then suddenly he shifts back to a stage which is called a REM sleep. And this cycle continues with certain modifications uh, throughout the night. So there's five to six cycles of REM, non-REM sleep usually occur in a healthy young adult. Now, a few uh, features, general, very general features of REM sleep I would like to go through. The human uh, non-REM sleep, which can be also called as slow-wave sleep, was traditionally classified into four stages. And as I said a few seconds back, American Academy of Sleep Medicine, which actually govern and dictate what is happening in the uh, field of sleep uh, science, has classified um, stage three and four as one single stage for reasons um, which are difficult to explain within this short time. And what you see is from REM stage one to four, you find a successively deeper stages of sleep. And each of deeper uh, stages of non-REM sleep shows increasing voltage and decreasing frequency. And muscles, including the upper airway muscles, about which you hear a lot, lot today, and progressively relax during uh, deep uh, non-REM uh, non sleep. And this muscle relaxation, which was considered earlier, was a passive relaxation. Now we know that. It is not just a passive relaxation. It is actually a, a active process which has in part the active hyperpolarization of the lower motor neurons. Now, the body temperature is uh, slightly reduced in uh, non-REM sleep. And this is also uh, an active process. The body temperature is reset at a slightly lower level. It is not a passive uh, lowering of body temperature because you are just lying without any activity. Heart rate and uh, BP decline, but there is an increase in the gastrointestinal motility. And there is generally a predominance of parasympathetic activity uh, in all steep stages. And some of these uh, changes in sympathetic, parasympathetic dominance would uh, result in many of the consequences of disturbed sleep you will hear today. And sleeper makes, um, I mean sleeper makes some postural adjustment throughout night, roughly um, about 20 minutes uh, or at intervals of 20 minutes. And those uh, awakened from non-REM sleep have poor sensory motor function. I mean, of course, anyone woken from uh, the sleep would have uh, a sensory motor function. And this is poorer than what is compared from a person who is woken from a REM sleep. And non-REM sleep alternates with a REM sleep. And the REM sleep, the name came itself because there are rapid eye moments, which are R-E-M, and there are, which are, uh, because of the bursts of 
movements of the eyeball. And correlated with RAM, there are uh, what is called PGO waves, pontogenic occipital waves, and which are difficult to be picked up in uh, human beings, but well picked up in animal experiments where you have the electrodes implanted deep into the brain and locally picked up and you can see the progression away from starting from the pons genically to the occipital area. And uh, EEG resemblance uh, that are uh, in animals, uh, that are the weak states and that's why the term which is also used to describe REM sleep uh, is paradoxical sleep, uh, but uh, usually used for describing the so-called REM sleep in animals. In human, the EEG resembles that of the stage one of non-REM sleep with uh, low voltage mixed waves. There is decreased thermoregulatory ability. Unlike what you saw in non-REM sleep, here there is a decrease in the thermoregulatory ability and the body temperature shifts towards the ambient temperature. On the other hand, the brain temperature and brain metabolism are increased during this uh, phase and there is high parasympath parasympathetic tone uh, with people become highly constricted but um, in between there are also sympathetic activities coming. Now profound loss of muscle tone including the muscles of upper respiratory passage produced by the hyperpolarization. The first time it was demonstrated during the REM sleep or paradoxical sleep there is an active hyperpolarization of lower motor neurons which is responsible for the muscle relaxation but later it was shown it happens even during non-REM sleep. But the respiratory muscles and those of the eyeballs, middle ear, they remain active. They are not actively inhibited. Muscles show sudden switches in between also. There are also sudden respiratory changes and increased heart rate and coronary flow. Respiratory responses to hypoxia is also blunted and not only hypoxia and response to carbon dioxide is also grossly reduced and there is a reduced waking threshold in humans. I mean, I emphasize the fact because there is a tremendously increased threshold in animals. There is a marked difference of what happens in animals and human beings. Now, this uh, change uh, from sleep to wakefulness, as we all know, as we have all experienced, uh, the children, they have what is called polycyclic sleep pattern. In, as for, in fact, in most of the animals that we see around also have polycyclic uh, sleep pattern. And a normal uh, child, a newborn child, passes through several cycles of sleep, wake, sleep, wake, and uh, throughout day and night, which is, of course, is the nightmare for the mother. And this slowly changes to a biphasic pattern by usually around the time that we um, in India send our children to the nursery or uh, wherever uh, we can uh, send. Uh, but we always find that on these places where we send, they insist that the child sleeps uh, for a bit of time in the afternoon because they actually have physiologically a biphasic sleep pattern with an afternoon nap and which turns uh, uh, by the time they go to school they by and large change a monocyclic sleep pattern to be reverted back during old age many after age of 60 they shift back to a biphasic sleep pattern uh, forcing them to have a slight nap in the afternoon. And as uh, the child grows, there is a 
tremendous decrease in the amount of sleep, especially during the initial um, stages and initial ages. And this sleep uh, by and large comes to a steady state by the uh, teenage and then there is a slight decline. So uh, in old age there is a lower physiologically set shorter amount of sleep. So we when we um, see this pattern of elderly people complaining about um, not able to sleep, it is physiological. And if you look at the different uh, types of sleep, you find there is a decrease in the non-REM sleep and there is also a decrease in the slow wave sleep. And slow wave sleep, especially the deeper stages, stage 3 and 4 and all, gets tremendously decreased as we uh, progress in age, even, even uh, as we pass uh, 40, 50 years, there is a, a tremendous decrease in these so-called deeper stages of sleep, which is normal physiologically. This is showing a little diagrammatically. So when the child um, is born, most of his sleep is REM sleep. And uh, we know from a few studies that the pattern of sleep or uh, pattern of electrical activity uh, picked up from the fetus primarily consists of a pattern which is resembling REM sleep. So that we can assume that the fetus is having by and large REM sleep and REM sleep probably REM sleep alone. And as the child comes out, uh, his um, uh, REM sleep is high and a, a premature child will have a higher amount of uh, REM sleep and then the other children. And they go down, they decrease and you can see within uh, this uh, log scale uh, below and you can see that there is tremendous decrease in the amount of sleep which is happening. Now, a few words about uh, theories of sleep re regulation. Traditionally, it was believed that uh, prolonged activity during daytime results in being uh, tired at the end of the day and uh, it's followed by a rest and at night it is rest in the form of sleep. And even uh, great people like Charles Sherrington and Pavlo uh, used to think that it is um, a passive state which is happening. Now sleep uh, then around 50s the, the whole uh, concept changed and the passive state was replaced by an active state theory and uh, it, it was considered um, active because we know that the brain activity only marginally gets reduced during uh, the sleep. So, um, the employing various modern techniques, then they found out that if it is an active state, there must be certain regions of the brain which are responsible for that. And uh, of course, this is my my field of study, and I'm really not going to spend much time uh, on it, except showing a very simplified diagram to show that uh, there are certain regions of the brain which are primarily identified uh, with the thalamus and the cortex as the center stage in the whole regulatory process, primarily changing the EEG. And this thalamus and cortex is influenced by uh, other areas in the brain, especially the brain stem, uh, posterior hypothalamus, and the basal forebrain and the caudal brainstem. And they interact with the thalamus and also interact with the cortex and the basal forebrain and the caudal brainstem primarily have been ascribed the role of producing so-called non-REM sleep and the brainstem 
uh, and posterior, especially posterior hypothalamus, having ascribed the role of uh, producing the wakefulness and the brainstem, especially in around pons, have the additional circuit responsible for the REM sleep. Now, uh, we have uh, passed uh, several of these theories and uh, we know now that to say some circuit like this is responsible for sleep is rather oversimplification because we know that sleep is um, not a state and the cyclic pattern of change in the activity is found throughout the brain. Every part of the brain as through and now we say that without going into much detail sleep is neither an active nor a passive state. All brain segments have inherent sleep-wake oscillation. Dynamic interaction of neuronal network throughout the brain ultimately results in this shift from wakefulness to sleep. And different sleep signs occur. And the division of sleep into non-REM and REM is also within, within certain limits. We look at certain signs that we are uh, looking at and we are seeing, we are observing on the basis of which we say this is non-REM, this is REM. And sleep signs add only the state specific qualities to the sleep and wakefulness. And basal forebrain and hypothalamus actually have a role in integrating the sleep with many of the vegetative functions. And also I should say a few words that we have a 24-hour sleep wakeful pattern. We all follow that. And this sleep wakeful pattern of 24 hours is not really the one which is set by the brain. There are some regions in the brain which are primarily responsible for setting this cycle and that sets the cycle to about actually 25 hours more than our normal 24 hour rhythm and this can be shown if you put a person in an environment which gives the external clues he follows the 24 hour pattern but if you put him in a situation like a cave or in an isolated room where there is no clue of the external world then you find slowly his sleep is shifting every day by an hour or so and so in in such a way that once he is taken back to the environment, his cycle comes back to 24 hour cycle. So there is a environmental influence which also influences our sleep wakeful pattern. Now is sleep essential for life? Sleep deprived animals, you know experimentally whether we cannot show it in uh, human beings. If you deprive an animal of uh, sleep, it dies in two to three weeks. But it is startlingly different if you uh, deprive a rat of food, it takes up to four weeks, it can live up to four weeks. So it, it, sleep is something more important than food. Now sleep is preserved throughout the revolution. And this may not be apparent in the form of sleep and wakefulness defined as per the criteria given for human beings. They sometimes have a rest activity cycle. And all mammals have so-called REM, non-REM cyclic alteration. And any part of the sleep which is deprived has a rebound. If you deprive a person of uh, REM sleep, there is a rebound and man shows very disturbed behavior after sleep deprivation about which you are going to hear a lot and lot. A few words about what is functions of sleep. It is said that uh, sleep facilitates the synthetic uh, synthesis of molecules that protect the brain cells from oxidative stress. And it is also said to be restorative. What is restorative? Sleep may be having a restorative and recovery function, especially for the brain. There is certainly an energy conservation. Uh, if 
a slight reduction in the whole metabolism by about 15 percent and it also has something called a thermoregulatory function and uh, many many neurons which have been ascribed as playing a role in sleep regulation are also uh, altering its firing altering its activity with change in temperature external or internal and brain growth um, uh, you also find that uh, some part of the sleep especially REM sleep has a role to play in terms of brain growth probably that's why the fetus has a lot of REM sleep and the newborn a newborn has not fully developed brain in that sense that we find in some other animals where you find a lot of uh, REM sleep and in fact if if you look at those animals which are all almost self-sufficient when they are uh, born they have much less amount of REM sleep now it facilitates neurogenesis we used to think that the brain uh, cell development uh, multiplication is coming to an end by the time we are born now we know it's not true and there are certain regions especially in the dendrite gyrus and all the uh, cell proliferation still continues and this is affected by sleep deprivation and there is what is called memory consolidation this, in fact if you look at the literature during the last uh, 10 years probably 15 to 20 times increase in the number of papers which are coming to substantiate the memory consolidation uh, theory of sleep that does not mean that we know the last word about it which still it is a debatable factor and discharge of emotions through sleep is something which has been uh, ascribed function and we daily experience this and I would like to conclude by saying that uh, there are many many physiological changes which are essential for life occurs during sleep I want to emphasize that we know some functions of sleep there are many that we still do not know many many we still do not know and what we define Dr. Mohan sleep, Kumar could you just wind up in about three minutes we are already yes, stepping up uh, electrophysiologically and behaviorally defined sleep do not explain all aspects of sleep important sleep for health and survival is best demonstrated by disastrous consequence resulting from sleep deprivation thank you